restoration. It began as a federally funded program called Project LECA, which was administered by Hillsborough Community College. Its focus was centered primarily on the applied restoration of coastal wetlands. Most of the paper this time will go directly to our next presenter. And our next presenter is Tom Mayers, who's with Lands End Marine. And the topic of his presentation is mangrove trimming in the Sarasota Bay area, 1970 to 2003. Reflections on 30 years of mangrove trimming on the west coast of Florida. <coughs> Clippers or a, uh, a 
chainsaw on a pole, an extension chainsaw. So, you know, I know exactly what he's talking about, but I just think he was a pioneer and uh, should get some recognition. You know, when I went to New College, he was uh, doing his embryology, but on the side, he, we did uh, uh, field botany was one of the classes. We uh, went to islands. Uh, that's my home where I live. You can see I have a dock and have mangroves, and I've been dealing with that for years. Across the bayou, there's a, a development that my family did, eight, eight, eight acres of property back in 1970. Uh, all of a sudden, they became very interested in mangrove trimming when they started to see how much it cost to put seawalls in to develop the property. So in the beginning, the uh, mangrove, my involvement with mangrove trimming was really sort of a selfish involvement. They uh, wanted to make some money selling waterfront property, uh, didn't want to put the money into seawalls. Uh, you know, back then it was very expensive. Today it's even more expensive to build seawalls not to mention how bad it is for the environment. Um, this mangrove trimming is really a selfish issue. We all enjoy uh, the environment as it is. You know, as I told you, I've been here for 50 years. I remember when it was a lot more environment and a lot less people. And uh, today we have more and more people coming in. Uh, just to give you an idea of the growth in Florida and on the west coast of Florida, um, on the island where I live, we had uh, 1,000 people in 1960. Today we have almost 20,000 people. So, gives you an idea of the growth. You think that seems amazing if you look at Florida. Florida had about 1 million people in 1960, and today has almost 20 million people. So it's a lot of growth, and you're uh, adding to the, uh, the population. One of our base, basic uh, premises uh, when we began doing mangrove studies was, uh, yeah, that's a rattlesnake I caught by one of the uh, projects and um, we released it somewhere. My father was a rattlesnake catcher, so um, it just seemed like the thing to do. You know, there were people and a rattlesnake and he put him in a bucket and took him out of there. So anyway, uh, this is one of my projects. Uh, I did 10 miles of shoreline. I've uh, designed projects for big developers. I'll try not to mention any names so that uh, they're my clients and I try to protect them. And oftentimes I'll be called into a project and I'll look at uh, something and I'll say, I can't be involved. Um, for some reason, you don't have a permit, you ought to have a permit. There's violations here. If I call the DEP in to look at this, uh, this site, you most likely would be cited with a violation. Um, I have these quotes that I wanted to drop in just because I, they're my favorite quotes. Uh, one man said, uh, he, says, he says, I like the environment. He says, I love the environment. He says, I just want to see the environment. <laughs> so to give you an idea of the homeowner's perspective, um, I sympathize with the DEP and I, I like their earnest efforts that they're doing. I think that the uh, <coughs> book on mangrove trimming is, uh, really a good effort to describe something that's fairly complicated. Uh, I talked to, uh, I guess it was Catherine Gilbert with the DEP about, you know, some issues in the book. And I told her that, uh, you know, those small issues seem minor. The most important thing that I've seen is non-enforcement. Um, if you don't enforce the law, no matter how good the law is, uh, you are educating people to break the law. So you get homeowners, you tell other homeowners, you get someone in one development to tell someone in another development, well, you're crazy to get a permit. You're crazy to try to do it legally. Look at what we're doing. You know, we're doing it illegally and we're getting away with it. We have no problems. So those are the things that I deal with all the time. And I think the most important thing is that, uh, you know, we understand that these laws are, uh, you know, they're just like, the, uh, the DEP is in the, the situation like if you make comparables, you would say it's like the building park. If all of a sudden you saw in an area on a, in a town that uh, two-story buildings were going up where they weren't zoned for two-story buildings, that would raise some red flags and questions. If you saw that uh, all of a sudden somebody had put an addition on their house. So there's real money values to the 
administration and regulation of this law. And I think everybody should realize that this is a level of scrutiny. I had one homeowner that told me, he says, I consider that the value, that's a mangrove snake, which is fairly unusual and endangered. It's in my back. So anyway, um, you know, basically, um, you know, basically, uh, these laws are, are very important because one homeowner told me, he says, the value of your trimming my mangroves is $100,000. I deal with real estate all the time. My sister has one of the biggest real estate companies in our area. I don't question his assumption at all. The fact that he had been trimming his mangroves for a long time, the fact that he had an unfettered view caused him to be able to sell his house for more money. So there's a lot of money involved. I think people, the DEP is going to have to look at this, that this is a, a really got to be a critical thing. It is a law. In 1976, it was a regulation. It was not a law. And then 1996, it became a law. The DEP said that the police should no longer enforce the law. The towns and city should no longer enforce the law. So now the DEP is the sole person. I get calls all the time on my old projects. They said, Tom, did you do this? That's right at my house right there, and that's my boat I use to trim mangroves. Um, but they said, uh, you know, did you do this? Did you cut this 50-foot tree or 45-foot tree in half? I said, no, obviously I didn't do it. They've got another mangrove trimmer who's in there who's younger, more aggressive, could care less, and I guess doesn't worry about any fines. As long as no fines are being implemented, you're going to get, it's like the Wild West. Who can trim the most? I'm not showing you mangroves trimmed down to two or three feet to show you how aggressively I can trim. Uh, I try to trim within the law. And one of the things that John used to teach us is, you know, always do what you believe in and always uh, try to just walk the straight and narrow. So when I go in, I'm basically trying to give people the law as best I understand it. I don't uh, try to uh, say, well, I can do more than the next guy. And I've lost a lot of projects. Uh, fortunately, I have a lot of people who want to trim legally. This is what I do when I'm writing a permit application. I do that for homeowners. Um, another thing I've done is some exotic tree removal from mangroves. People say, is, uh, is this mangrove trimming any good for the trees? Well, it is if I'm in there getting Brazilian peppers and Australian pines off the trees and I'm getting vines out of the trees. There's a lot of vines, native vines, that completely cover and eventually kill the trees. So, it can actually be good for the trees, and there is some sloughing off of branches that occurs naturally. So you see, uh, you know, branches just after a storm or a heavy wind, you'll see the branches break off and the tree remains there and continues to grow. So in a way, that's a kind of natural pruning. And if anybody's seen a heavy, uh, hurricane wind or something like that, it'll break the top branches right off the tree, and the tree remains and continues to grow. Uh, I have uh, talked to the, the people uh, from Hillsborough Community College about this uh, presentation, and I told them I was going to bring in some items, and it just seemed so awkward, but I thought I would just tell you about them. One is when you're working from a boat or you're working from land and you're trimming a mangrove, I use a pole that's like a one and a half inch dowel pole. It's 15 feet long. I have it with uh, five foot measurements up the pole so I can hold it up like this and all of a sudden I've got a 22 foot accurate measurement. Uh, I use it for getting branches out of the trees. A lot of the developments I work for are very specific. They don't want any branches in the water. They don't want any dead branches hanging in the trees. So a lot of my time is spent removing um, dead branches from the trees and removing branches from the water. I might spend as much time removing uh, branches from the water and uh, from the trees as I do cutting. Um, Another thing that I, I did when I, in my study, I have a thesis and I've 
donated one copy to Hillsborough Community College so they could have it in, the, uh, in their library uh, or for the environmental science library. And this is a thesis I did for graduation from New College with John. And it's, the title was uh, Sarasota Bay Mangroves, 1991, Fast Alteration and Future Possibilities. So this has been 30 years that we've been mangrove trimming. And not many people have stayed with it. A lot of people have dropped off. Like you say, a lot of people have gotten old and, and they kind of have gotten out of it. John used to do a lot of it. Um, Another observation that I'd like to make, since this is a group of people who are scientifically interested in the subject of wetlands, is uh, a topic that's been currently uh, you know, real popular is the effects of sea level rise. And it's been my observation, and I haven't seen it anywhere else, so I assume that's an original observation, that the seagrasses may uh, grow in areas that were previously mangrove areas. Uh, you know, it takes a long time to get a lot of nutrients in an area, and seagrasses like, uh, you know, nutrients, and, and so it just only makes sense to me that with gradual sea level rise, the mangroves are coming up, and that the seagrasses have taken over those areas. So I just have a little bit of time left. I'll just leave you with a typical John Morrill uh, observation. <laughs> One day I was in his lab and he had the electron microscope going and he had the pre-med students going and he had all of this going and he says, he looked at me and he says, you know, and he says, the, all these uh, plants drop leaves at a certain time of the year. He said, the buttonwoods drop their leaves at a certain time, the mangroves drop their leaves at another time, the seagrasses drop their leaves at another time. They all fertilize each other. So you have this interdependency that goes with the mangroves. You have all the animals that I've tried to portray some of them, the fishing. So our real interest in mangroves is a selfish interest. We want the environment to stay the same. We want to enjoy all the things that the environment offers. But at the same time, some of these homeowners want to view. I think the uh, DEP has done a good job with education. The website seems really good. There are some details that need to be worked on, uh, like grandfathering in. Like sites that are grandfathered in, oftentimes those are just violations. And you, you have somebody comes in, they cut their tree in half, they no longer have a 50 foot tree, maybe they have a you know, 23 foot tree. So now they can make it a hedge. Uh, I think uh, one of the things, an observation I'd like to make is that uh, you know, that these uh, trees, you know, to say that a 24-foot tree is a small tree and should be able to be hedged. Um, sometimes that's the biggest that tree is going to get, that it's somehow because of the environmental conditions, it doesn't have uh, everything that it could have uh, to, uh, to grow to be that 45-foot tree. So I think you need to look at that and there needs to be some fine adjustments to, to this book. And as John said, he says, this is a great handbook, but he says, it's not a Bible. So to look at this and try to adjust the few problems that, that are there, to use it as a guideline for trimming, uh, we're talking about preservation of existing. It's like the argument about old growth forests and uh, this you know, new growth where you clear cut and you do the revegetation. And since you all are revegetation experts, I would just ask you, how much would it cost to revegetate an area with 25 foot tall mangroves, one acre? So this is what we're trying to preserve so you all don't have to do it. That's not to say that revegetation isn't a good thing. I think it's a great thing. It offers lots of possibilities. So uh, that's about all I have to say. So are there any questions?